Good morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm David Berto. I'm the director of our National Security Program on Industry and Resources. Uh, welcome to our, our new building. It was built expressly for this kind of, of a discussion this morning. Uh, one of the side benefits, though, is that many of you get to see people who you don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we try to build in some face-to-face -face discussion time as well. Um, that was the time between 7.30 and now. And so now we're, uh, we're ready to move on. I want to also welcome our viewers on the web. We have a growing web presence, and an awful lot of you um, uh, watch from the web. Uh, at the end, when we're doing the questions, uh, uh, I'll give you my email. So those of you who are on the web and want to email questions in can email some questions as well. Uh, I have just a couple of administrative announcements before I turn it over uh, for the introduction. If you would silence your cell phones, uh, we do have substantially better reception here than we did in our old building, and so it's more important now that you silence your cell phones than it used to be, because if you were far enough back in the basement, it couldn't penetrate anyway. Uh, so, And uh, also to the viewers on the web, you do not need to silence your cell phones. Um, John, uh, I will bring you up to introduce uh, our guest this morning, uh, our CEO and President, Dr. John Hamry. Please welcome in. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, glad you're here. Uh, this is, uh, I'll, I'll just apologize, this is still a construction zone. We're still, <laughs> we're still moving in. Every night there's crews here trying to fix the punch list. I think we're down to... 1,700 items now, so we're, we're, we're making progress, you know. Uh, but I do think that th we're ready here, and we're delighted uh, to be able to welcome all of you. And I want to say special thanks to Frank Kendall for coming. This is the first big thing that we've done here. We, we did our Global Security Forum earlier, and of course his boss was here. But uh, that's, a, that's a little bit more show. This is a little more work, and we're really delighted that Frank is here to kind of kick this off. Um, I, obviously, you all came because you n know who Frank Kendall is, so my standing here to introduce him is, would be a waste of your time. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a real privilege that we are able to have someone of his talent and dedication you know, who's working in the department these days. Uh, it is a tough time. It's a really tough time. I can't remember a more complicated landscape for especially the acquisition executive. Uh, what can you count on that's real? You know, what, what, what's going to happen in the Congress? You know, what, what planning horizon is feasible? Uh, and it's, it's pr probably the most complex landscape that you could imagine, and yet the, the business of government is sound, sensible, fair decisions that have to be made. And Frank has championed that, uh, which uh, I think we're all grateful for. He's going to, you know, I suspect a lot of people here are going to ask questions about other things, but we want him to speak about the success in transforming and, and streamlining the acquisition process. I think he will at least try to get some of that in, and I would indulge, ask you to focus on that while he's here, because that is the purpose of the day. Uh, but understand the complexity of the problem that he's working with, and then you'll realize uh, what an honor it is that he's breaking away for, for some minutes and spending the time with us. So with your applause, would you please welcome Frank Kendall. Well, thank you, John. It's always great to be here. Well, I guess it's always great to be at CSIS. <laughs> Uh, Eight-year journey to bring this building uh, to reality and to, and to move over here. Congratulations to the organization. It's a great venue. Uh, and I'm delighted to be your first uh, topical conversation here. Secretary Hagel was here earlier, as John mentioned. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the things that John uh, described, both what I'm doing in the acquisition system and also the current budget situations. He's absolutely right that uh, and I would agree with you, John, that it, this is probably the worst time I've seen, too, in terms of our ability to uh, do a sound plan and execute it with any kind of confidence at all. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about our acquisition system and how it's doing. I put out a document a few months ago. I don't know how many of you have seen the performance of the Defense Acquisition System first annual report? Okay, It's a document that I put out a few months ago uh, without a great deal of fanfare. Uh, it's gotten a lot of reaction and response from various and sundry communities. The intent was to 
put some data on the table and start looking at how we're actually doing by a number of different metrics uh, and to get a feel for you know, who's doing better than some other people and why, start to understand what's happening, and then you can go start to analyze why. So I tried to take out of it a lot of the analysis or speculation, really, about why these things are as they are. But let's start with what's going on, you know, what's really been happening over the last 20 odd years and even longer. Uh, and one of the things that strikes you when you do that is how little things seem to change, despite all the different episodes of acquisition reform that we've had. You know, I've lived through most of them. John's lived through many of them. Dave Berto's lived through many of them. A lot of you in the audience have lived through a lot of them. And I, I tend to shy away from talking about acquisition reform. I think a better way to think about this, and a better way maybe to talk about it, is to talk about acquisition improvement. Because that forces you to confine your thinking to specific things you can do that will make a difference. And I don't think, frankly, that you can wave away the entire system and start over and expect to have something that looks very, very different from what you have today. You know, the types of decisions we have to make, the types of processes we have to go through to field weapon systems, the fact that we have to do contracts and have to do them with a certain set of rules isn't going to change. Uh, so we gotta look deeper than that. And the idea was to start that process of looking deeper than that and really understanding. The other thing that's true about acquisition is that it's incredibly complex, okay? It's, uh, it, it, en it encompasses so many different things that have to be done well to get good outcomes that it's very, very difficult to pull out and correlate specific factors. We looked at, in the course of preparing the report, we looked at a whole host of different things, uh, and it was very hard to find correlations, even if you look back over 20 or 30 years of data. I do want to share with you something from the report. It's a discussion of a specific program. I'm gonna kind of loosely uh, quote this here. Uh, the program had an innovative but unconventional design, and it was criticized as extravagant. It, it included a multi-mission requirement that spanned both irregular warfare and high-intensity warfare, putting conflicting demands on the design. It included the use of exotic materials that delayed construction and raised costs. Uh, there was a divided political establishment. It argued over the need and the cost. Contracts were spread around a number of states, largely for political purposes. Cost growth was excessive, and it caused schedule slips and program instability. The Congress was alarmed at the cost and schedule delays and conducted inquiries and railed against the waste that was going on in the program. Everybody know what the program was? 1794, the first six frigates that we built for the Navy. Sound familiar? So there's been a lot of acquisition reform, not just in our lifetimes, but people have been talking about it for a very, very long time. Uh, it was not, as some of you might have guessed, the F-35 or anything else that's more current. Uh, so this is not a new problem for people to address and try to, try to solve. So I think that the way we have to attack it is by getting a deeper look at the data and recognizing that maybe some of the fundamentals are our problem. Maybe it's not the organization of OSD. Maybe it's not the type of contract we choose. And there's interesting data in here that suggests that contract type does not really change things very much. Uh, my belief, my firm belief, is that at the end of the day, there's some very simple factors that drive outcomes in acquisition. And it starts with professionalism. I was interviewed the other day about, by what, about one of our programs and was asked you know, what we could do to improve. And I started with that. Professionalism on both the industry side and the government side. Uh, leadership matters. Leadership is incredibly important. Hard work is next. And then the last thing I'll put on my list is a measure of courage to do the hard things when it's expedient many times to just go ahead, you know, spend the money, award the contract, don't wait till you've got the right business deal, don't wait till the risk is out of the program, just keep going. It takes a certain amount of courage to do that. I think those are the things that at the end of the day matter. And all of those things are not about, you know, the degree of how we organize the decision process or, the, or whether OSD checks something or not. They're really about people and their ability and their power to do their jobs well. And I think as I, built this year's uh, version, last year's version of better buying power, I added that element. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I, as I go on. There are no easy answers. Uh, in better buying power, better buying power 2.0, we went from about 20 items up to about 35. And I was criticized for that by a, a former undersecretary for acquisition who said, that's too many. You know, you only need, you know, gotta have like four or five so people can you know, rem remember the list, I guess. Uh, I think we actually are doing many more things than are on the better buying power list. We're doing hundreds of things to try to improve. And I think that is actually how you do improve. You have to attack on a lot of fronts 
and get a lot of things right. It's, it's very detailed, difficult work. Um, what's going to happen next with this? Uh, I was asked to talk about that. There will be, this says it's the annual report of 2013. There will be another one, and I hope this will be a continuing process. The, the uh, intent is to expand on the data set that we have, so we'll build on that. Uh, it may see a bit more analysis. There are some things in here, like the fact that statistically fixed cost, uh, fixed pricing and, uh, and cost plus pricing seem to get the same results in terms of the statistical outcome uh, as the data shows. That's sort of surprising to me. And we're going to try to dig deeper and understand why that happens. Uh, there are a couple of possibilities. Some of them are good and some of them are not so good. Uh, the not so good one is that we're not using fixed price the way it was intended to be used. We're actually adding money when there's a need for more money to complete the job, which is not what the intent normally is with fixed price. Um, we'll expand the data set. We'll look deeper. Uh, there'll be some more analysis. Um, we'll bring in some new data. One of the uh, sources of the data, the sources of the data that were used here are largely public databases, the federal uh, procurement database system, and the SAR reports that we send to the Congress. We're going to go beyond that and start using, and I've been looking at some very interesting data out of the cost reporting that CAPE gets. Uh, CAPE uh, has all of our programs basically, uh, this is by statute, I think, report the cost uh, that they experience. And we're looking at that data. It's proprietary because it shows people's rates and so on. But we can look at it as a class within the government and then start to aggregate it and draw some conclusions. And what you can look at there, interestingly, is profit. You can look at margins. And you can see what something cost, but you can also see what the government paid as a fee uh, to industry to do that, that particular job. And there's some very interesting results. Some of them are quite consistent with what you would expect. But there are cases where we pay higher fees for poorer performance. And that's a very interesting thing to say. That's the, it's an inverse incentive. We have to do that. One of the elements of better buying power is to, is to go in and look at the uh, the way we tied incentives together with, with uh, uh, outcomes, with performance, so that industry is motivated to do as well as they can. The, uh, in general, what, the, what those numbers tend to show is that we're paying a relatively modest margin for R&D, for development of our programs, we're paying a significantly higher margin for production. I think that's as it should be. Okay? I think that I want industry to recognize that getting out of development and into production is important. I think if we publish these numbers, it'll be kind of interesting industry to learn this. I'm not sure that there's a, little, a deep understanding of this, so you would expect that. Uh, I'm not sure that understanding really exists to the extent that it ought to in industry. Okay, I'm going to mention a couple of other things that I'm doing. Uh, I know many of you are anxiously awaiting 5002 to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, uh, um, I was hoping that, you know, when this came out, I might get on the Daily Show. Uh, I am absolutely certain that 5002 will not get me on the Daily Show. <laughs> Uh, but it's very close. Uh, I've been working on it. It's how I spend most of my weekends, unfortunately, and I'd like to stop that. So um, it'll be out very soon. Uh, I think I'll look at a, some final edits, I think, later in the week, and we'll have it out as an interim document. Uh, I'll make a couple of comments about it. There is a draft that's been circulating, so I think many of you are probably aware of this. Emphasizing tailoring even more than previous editions did. And we show people, show people multiple models of how you can structure an acquisition program, depending upon what the product is. You know, at the end of the day, the, the, the way you structure the, the program to develop, produce, and feel the product depends on what the product is and what it takes to get that job done. And there's a, there's a logic and, a, and a, a, a flow that has to be consistent with what you're trying to accomplish. And it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all business. We do a large, large range of different types of things. So 5002 is coming. It's very close. Um, one of the things that I learned, and I've mentioned this before here, I think, as I went through and, and we redid 5002, uh, partly because there have been a number of laws passed that we needed, needed to uh, in, include in the document and uh, implement through the document, was how complex this had all become. There are, there's a section at the front of the 5002 which basically lays out you know, what the acquisition system is and you know, what, what the uh, program structures look like, what the major decision points are, and so on. And then there's a series of tables that have all those statutory compliance requirements. And those tables go on and on and on. And the reason they're there, and the reason there's so much, is because of a large body of, of statutes that have passed over the years governing acquisition. And it, all of this is well-intentioned. And they're all, all of this encompasses, for the most part, things that are, that, that are positive and have a good outcome. But it has become amazingly complex. So if you're a, a major uh, acquisition program, if you're a major automated information systems program, if you're a business program, if you're an IT program, you have a whole set of rules that you have to follow. And then, of course, we add on to that a few other things, such as urgent needs and how we respond to those. 
So what is needed, frankly, is somebody to go back and take a look at all the things essentially that we've done since Goldwater Nichols was passed that have piled on somewhat independently uh, and made our program manager's lives incredibly complex and simplifies that. And I've got one of my staff, I've got Andrew Hunter, who was my chief of staff and who, I've, who has come back recently uh, uh, into a situation in the building where he has more time to do this. I've asked him to lead this effort. And I want to work closely with the Hill on this. I think this is not something we want to do in isolation. Uh, we, we don't want to throw everything out and start over, but we do want to take that body of law and look at what's being accomplished by it or attempted to be accomplished by it and simplify it so that program managers have a much clearer, more easily understood body of uh, uh, requirements that they have to follow. So that, that's an initiative. I'm, and that's not going to be a quick and easy job. That's going to take us several more months at least to do that. I've mentioned Better Buying Power 2.0. We're, we're well into implementation of 2.0. Uh, we've got a lot of work left to do there. We've had a few distractions like furloughs and government shutdowns, uh, but we're still working on that. The, the business senior integration group that I chair still meets about monthly uh, and largely is tracking our progress and, and moving things forward there. Not as quickly as I had hoped on some of them. Uh, uh, there are new ideas, of course, that come out as we go through that. One of the things we're going to be instituting that I signed out recently is uh, uh, we're establishing essentially professional qualification boards that will be looking at our senior people, our, more, uh, our, our people who will handle or, or be asked to take on what we call key leadership positions. Now, these are positions like program manager, deputy program manager, chief engineer, chief contracting officer, uh, chief support uh, per, uh, official in the program, logistics support person, program support person. Those people and a few others that are the leadership I talked about earlier that make or break the success of a program on the government side. And what we're going to have is a, a system of joint boards that look at the qualifications of these people and give them sort of the stamp of approval, if you will, that they are ready to take on a key leadership position. And it's going to be a mixture of real life experience, education, training, as well as some references from some of the senior people that those people have worked with. And I think doing this across the department is going to strengthen overall the level of profession we have in that workforce. Now, this won't be initially, because it'll take some time to get this in place, this will initially be a discriminator among people. But as we get it more into place, I think it's going to become a necessity for people who want to occupy those positions to be certified or qualified by the, by the boards we're setting up. I do not have a plan right now to do a Better Buying Power 3.0, but give me another year or so, and we might, might start to think about that as more ideas get on the table. Uh, we're also working closely with industry. We've had some interest from industry and in, continuing, and, and this was always something we intended to continue independent of the Better Buying Power initiatives, uh, some interest in doing some more work on reducing overhead. And I know John has written, so John Hamry has written some things about this. Um, I've asked industry to give us some inputs, and we have a team that Katrina McFarland, whom I think I saw walk into the room, uh, my assistant secretary for acquisition, is putting together to work within the government, but with a great deal of input and interaction with industry uh, on things that are adding cost but not adding value. Uh, there are a lot of things that we impose on industry. Uh, we've heard this from industry a lot. We want to get to the specifics. You know, it's, it's, again, it's not about reform. It's about improvement and specific things we can do to move us forward and in the right direction. So I'm hopeful that we'll get some good results out of that and drive some unnecessary overhead out of the system. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the budget situation briefly. John mentioned it. Uh, it is one of the worst environments that I've ever seen uh, to try to manage in, uh, in the Pentagon. And... Uh, there are several things about this current situation. Uh, we're confronted right now with what we call the orange triangle. If you heard the briefings on the Strategic Choices Management Review, we often refer to this region on our PowerPoint slides on the graph uh, of cuts that we'd have to take where we try to figure out how we're going to fill in those cuts. It's called the orange triangle. And it's sort of the period between now, basically, and the next three or four years. Uh, because we can't remove force structure, we can't remove civilian uh, workforce from the, from the DOD uh, instantaneously, in, and because the cuts are very steep and, and do happen instantaneously, we have this period of about three or four years where we really have a very, very hard time uh, fitting into it a reasonable set of uh, 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 budget content. That's called the Orange Triangle, and we're in the Orange Triangle. We started into it in 13, uh, and what we did in 13 was essentially, FY13, was, was what I would call damage limitation. You know, sequestration was imposed in the spring, uh, and what everybody did was try to find a way to get by with 8% less than they thought they were going to have. That's essentially what we did. 
We move some money around within our reprogramming authorities that Congress gave us to help readiness primarily. Uh, we deferred a lot of work. We deferred work that we you know, could delay into presumably FY14. But that was assuming sequestration went away. There is no money in FY14 to do that deferred work. And in fact, we have to take, if sequestration stays in place, over 50 billion out of FY14. So we're, we're operating under a CR. Uh, we're trying to constrain our, our spending, even though right now sequestration has not been implemented for 14. So it doesn't happen until January. We're, we're operating at a rate which we hope is consistent with sequestration as much as possible uh, so that we don't have the kind of problem we had last year. One of the things that last year's situation where we did not lower our rate early uh, forced on us was the furloughs of the civilian workforce uh, last summer, which we have, we have every hope and every intention of not having to repeat. But that being the case, uh, we've got to get the spending down now. We can't wait till January. We've got to lower it now. Otherwise, we're just setting up a bill for ourselves, particularly in the readiness accounts further on. There, of all the problems that sequestration brings, uh, there are three I'll mention. Uh, the worst one, I think, in a way, is the uncertainty that we face right now. The, the other problems are associated with the things I've been talking about. It's a deep cut. It's not, you know, we took 10% out. We took $50 billion out a couple of years ago per year. Sequestration takes another $50 billion per year. Uh, that's a large cut below the level we thought we needed to defend the country. So there's the steepness of the cut, which forces some very difficult choices. There's the lack of a ramp, okay, that I talked about earlier, where you've got to come down on a slope that is such that uh, you, can, you can gracefully make changes uh, and not do them abruptly. Uh, it's, a, it's a much better, uh, in fact, it makes it manageable, essentially, if you have a ramp. It's almost unmanageable if you don't. The, the impact of a ramp, and I'll say one more thing about that, is that we inevitably um, are in a situation where for the next few years we will have in some way a force that you could call hollow. We will not have enough training. We will not have enough acquisition. We will not have enough investment. So one way or the other over those next three years, until we can get force structure out, we are going to have shortfalls that are going to be debilitating the department. There is no avoiding that, okay, as sequestration stays in place. The, uh, the other problem that is really plaguing us right now is the uncertainty. And that's what John mentioned. We don't know what to plan for. So if we don't know where we're going to go, it's very hard to figure out how to get there. So we're looking at a range right now of possibilities and their implications. The skimmer was, uh, the strategic choices management review was intended to take a first cut at that. We did it and we, we put on the table things like the orange triangle I talked about and some of the problems and the very difficult choices between capability and capacity came out of the skimmer. Uh, but now we're into the reality of looking at budgets that are consistent with that. And, the, and that's a very, very painful process to go through. And it's compounded enormously by the fact that we don't know where we're going to end up in terms of budgets. Because where we're going to end up will drive how much force structure we can afford. Because we're going to have to have a force structure that we can buy readiness to support so that it's, a, it's not a hollow force, so it's trained uh, and, and equipped properly, have, has maintenance uh, spare parts and so on. And we also have to do investments that are consistent with that size force, which not, means both production and research and development. So we're, we're in a bit of a, a dilemma right now as we try to go through this, and hopefully we'll get some resolution. Uh, the worst case, probably, frankly, is to just kind of lurch forward from budget crisis to budget crisis, which is what we've been doing for the last few years. So hopefully, uh, out of the current process, we can get some relief from that and uh, get into a better management environment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the things I'm worried about. I've mentioned some of them, uh, uh, the things that are keeping me awake at night right now. The, the first one is this concern about the next three years and what's going to happen to the Defense Department over that period of time and how hard it's going to be to recover from that. You know, I, I was a small unit commander many years ago in, in, uh, in Germany, and I, I lived through the, the readiness crisis of the 70s where we could not, not get spare parts. We were just It was a horrible environment to operate in from an operational side, uh, you couldn't do your job. You knew you couldn't do your job. It's hard to keep your soldiers motivated. Uh, and we weren't ready. We couldn't have gone to war very effectively if we'd been asked to do it. Uh, it's a very hard thing to manage through. Uh, we can have a hollow force from the point of view of training and, and readiness or maintenance. We can have a hollow force from the point of view of uh, not doing enough investment in the future. And the impacts are at different points in time. You know, the hollow force for readiness is right now. The hollow force because you didn't do enough R&D and procurement is a few years down the road, but it's going to be there. There's a pipeline for the Department of Defense in terms of uh, the things that we have to do to sustain the force. So I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the next three years and how we get through it. I'm particularly worried about research and development accounts and what we're doing to them or maybe forced to do to them as we get to lower levels of budget. 
if you think about it, research and development is essentially a fixed cost for the department, or it ought to be. Research and development is essentially the, the account that governs how fast we can modernize. And if we have a suite of equipment, you know, and we have, you know, ships, tanks, planes, et cetera, and you want to keep those systems at a current state of technological superiority relative to any adversary, then you have to do the R&D to support all of those pieces of equipment at that rate. That is a fixed cost. It doesn't matter how many ships or how many tanks or how many planes you have, the R&D stays basically the same. The variable cost is the production rate. And you can change that. Production is a little bit different. Production depends on the size of the force that you have and how old you're willing to let your equipment get before you replace it. So there's more variability, in theory at least, on the production side of the house. But it obviously has to be tied to the size of the force structure and how long you're going to keep your equipment. Um, but I am worried about R&D because it tends to be, if you look historically at what happens in drawdowns, the thing that, that gets cut. Uh, I am worried about industry. Uh, it's, it's easy sometimes in the Pentagon as we're sitting around talking about the force structure and the readiness of the force and so on to, to, to not be aware of the fact that industry is part of our force structure. We are dependent on industry uh, to equip the force. And if we don't have a healthy industrial base, we're not going to have a healthy force. So that, that keeps me up a little bit at night as well. Uh, and it, particularly in these near years, because if we try to sustain readiness in these near years, that means the only place left to pay the bills is in the investment accounts, in R&D and procurement, which means it comes out of industry. And as we were going through the, the furlough situation, I put out a note to the workforce, and I said, you know, we're all affected by this, okay? The military people don't have the training they need to do their job. They don't have the equipment they need. They're not getting spare parts. Civilian workforce is being furloughed. They're losing, you know, they're having days without pay. And in industry, we're laying people off. You know, if we don't have the money to contract out to do the work, people are simply laid off. And I don't think, and there are a number of areas in the industrial base, I think Alana Boitman's with me here today, my industrial base person, uh, that we're, she is looking at very carefully for me, and we're looking at this very consciously as we go through the budget deliberations. The problem is we just don't have very much flexibility. So that's, that's on my list of worries. Then the government workforce. Um, we have put our workforce on the government side through a lot lately. They've been through three years of pay freezes, They've been through uh, furloughs last summer. They went through the government shutdown and all the uncertainty about that. Some of my best people uh, are really thinking carefully about do they really want to work for the government in this environment. And as far as recruiting is concerned, uh, well, <laughs> recruiting is tough. Let me just put it that way right now. It's not uh, the economy starting to come back up and people who would come to the government thinking that that was a place you could do meaningful work and you know, have a reasonable amount of job security uh, are, not, are not seeing that from the government right now. So it's hard. Building the professionalism of the workforce in this environment uh, is, is a real challenge. Okay, so those are the things that uh, I wanted to touch on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a little story from one of my former bosses uh, that I think is probably relevant. Secretary Gates told a story once about how he, uh, and this is when he was secretary, uh, uh, he had a staff meeting one morning. He had just been out to Texas A&M, I believe, where he'd formerly been the president. And he talked to a group of ROTC students out there. He said, yeah, I went in on this, this class that, all they wanted to talk about was strategy. They kept asking me questions about what I was doing about strategy. And I kept wanting to tell them, I'm just trying to get through the day. <laughs> I'm just trying to get through the day most days. So let me stop there and take a few questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Andre, go ahead. You're right in front of me. So uh, earlier this week. Hi, I'm Andre Yashalal, Lisa with Reuters. Um, last week there was an interesting incident in which Navair posted a pre-solicitation notice for uh, to purchase 36 additional Super Hornets or Growlers, and the notice was uh, then revoked or canceled. And uh, it just kind of raised a lot of questions about, you know, what is exactly happening in terms of acquisition priorities and the sort of exchange between the F-35 program and the Super Hornet and some of those choices. It sort of seemed like it was showing a little leg of the process <laughs> behind the scene. So can you illuminate I, what I, happened I, I, there and what your thoughts I, I think are the very, on that? I think the short answer is somebody made a mistake. <laughs> um, I, if, if, first of all, you know, we have a budget. 
that we aren't changing anything in our plans right now, except as we're forced to, and the budget's not going up, it's coming down. Okay, I just put out an ADM on the F-35. We just did a, 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 a very deep review of the F-35 and its status. And basically the short version of the ADM is that I think at this point in time, uh, we're prepared to budget to increase the production rate on the F-35. Now we're gonna have budget constraints, so the exact size of that ramp is gonna be subject to how much money we actually have. Um, there are some things that need to be done on the F-35 to, to finish the job of the development job, essentially. And I, I highlighted uh, getting the software done. Uh, I highlighted uh, improving the reliability of the aircraft, a number of its components, and I highlighted the ALICE system, the logistics support system, as things that we need to make additional progress on. I want to tie actually increasing the rates uh, and putting it those airplanes that we might put in the budget on contract to progress on those things, as well as completing working off some of the design issues that we've been working for the last couple of years. Uh, but the F-35 remains our highest priority. Uh, I think we're, uh, we're at a point now where we need to get the job done, uh, and I'm feeling much more positive about the program than I was a couple of years ago. So there is no real trade-off going on between 18s and 35s right now in the department. Okay. Let me get one. I'll get you in a minute, Tony. Let me get one right here first. Uh, my name's Everett Pyatt. Oh, sorry. I didn't know I needed that. My name's Everett Pyatt. I was a former acquisition executive of the Navy. Um, I'd like to congratulate you on the report. Thanks. In my opinion, it is the most significant document of systems acquisition since Peck and Shearer. That's 50 years. So uh, that's one. But out of that report came, to me at least, the realization that there's three, four hundred billion dollars of planned overruns that are incorporated in the out years. And that to me would be a tremendous target of opportunity in the, in the long range planning that you're trying to deal with. So uh, that's an observation made on, made from many rounds of bloody meetings. And um, I just, I just hope that we can use that money to do the, some of the things and readiness that you're talking about and squeeze out that fat. But I'd like to add a bit about the, the Constitution story. <laughs> the Greeks can, re, can have the same story about the ships they built to defeat the Persians 3,000 years ago. Yeah. It, same thing happened. True. They had, to, they had the, all the same debates. The ships were victorious and the Persians were sent back to Persia. So time doesn't change. Thank you. I'm not sure where that $300 billion is, but if you, I want you to come tell me. <laughs> 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 one, one of the things that's true is if you look historically at our programs, there, uh, there is a certain amount of very consistent, on average, uh, overrun in development and production. It, it's, it's come down a little bit in the last several years, uh, partly because I think we're budgeting to the ice now, the independent cost estimates. Uh, but there's no management reserve in the department. And one of the problems we, we, I, I, I deal with is that uh, absent that, it's very hard uh, to adjust things as programs get in trouble. One of the points I, I probably should have made is that we, we and it, it relates to the constitution of the, the, the six frigates of 1794, those ships went out and were an incredible success. Okay, they went out and they won eight out of 11 single combats against the best in the world. It was, um, it was shocking to, to England to discover that somebody could actually beat them in a single ship combat. And we did it repeatedly. And we did it because of the things that are described in part in the, uh, uh, new materials and so on, well-trained uh, sailors, obviously. But the, uh, <coughs> the results you get uh, uh, when you take chances often pays off. And I was asked in an interview uh, not too long ago if I thought we were being taking too much risk in the department. My answer was, no, we're not taking enough. You don't, be, you don't get to be the best in the world unless you take some risk. You don't get to be a generation ahead of everybody else unless you take some risk. Now, you've got to manage that risk, all right? Part of managing that risk ought to be some kind of an account where you can, can deal with things as they will happen in programs. But we don't have that, okay? The department doesn't have that. So on average, we overrun in development somewhere around 30%. On average, in production, early production, we overrun around 10%. Uh, so there's the opposite of the 300 billion essentially built into our budget out there somewhere uh, for, for those things to happen. And then we have to make adjustments as we go through. Programs can put a little bit of reserve into their programs as they build them, but we don't have anything at a higher level we hold to. Uh, so what we end up doing is we go in and we take money out of some other program, in some cases to fix one that's having problems to keep it going and, to, and keep it on track, uh, which is not a very efficient way to run, run things either. Uh, Tony, I still give you one. You're in the back. <coughs> 
I want to ask you about uh, unobligated balances that might be used in, to defray the F uh, FY14 sequestration. This, and in 13, you know that about six, five billion was used to defray investment cuts. Do you see roughly the same percentage or proportion going forward in 14? And are your acquisition people slowing down the issuing ADMs and contracts in hopes of husbanding uncommitted or unobligated funds to use in case of a full sequestration kicks in? I don't know the answer to your first question. I don't know how much will be available. Um, I think we have used up <clears throat> in going through 13 some of our flexibility going forward. <clears throat> I am holding back a few things right now uh, because of the uncertainty that I mentioned. Uh, where I can defer some work uh, and not make a financial commitment, uh, in a couple of cases we're doing that. Things that, you know, we, we may at least, we may not want to cancel them all right, but we may want to defer them for a few years until we get through that, that orange triangle I talked about. It's going to be a very hard period to manage through. Uh, once, once we get through that, uh, then we have to a period where we can start to recover and, you know, you know, bring readiness back up, you know, do some of the things that we can't do right now. So there's going to have to be some conscious decisions about all of those things. But again, the uncertainty makes it very, very hard to do that planning. Yeah, hi, John. <clears throat> Could you comment on the utility? Sorry? Oh, John Milam. Uh, can you comment on the utility analysis that you're getting to inform your acquisition decisions, particularly in regard to where your R&D money should be going? Um, <clears throat> we, the, uh, we're doing a lot of analysis that's increasingly threat-driven. Uh, as you look around the world at what people are doing out there, we're having to react in some cases to things that others are doing that are challenging our capabilities. So that's one of the things that's driving us. A lot of analysis going on in that. Uh, areas like some of the missile threats we face, some of the electronic warfare threats we face, for example. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is a fair amount of analysis that's being done to kind of set a strategic framework for the earlier S&T work and to prioritize that. We've been doing that for a while. So we have a few areas. I think Secretary Hegel mentioned a couple of them when he spoke here earlier in the week. Uh, Cyber's one, space is another where we're, uh, we're, we're doing things that are uh, with a strategic focus more. Now, the individual things that get done in those categories are the results of analysis that's conducted you know, at a lower level. Okay. I, I've been, I, I finally got somebody, I, I don't know the name. I've been, I, you're gonna think I have uh, uh, rigged who's gonna, I have questions I'm gonna take here. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Kendall. Max Kakis from FC International. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to speak to both the uh, Marine Corps CIO and the new head of Army Cyber, and both of them expressed some frustration with the limitations of uh, uh, acquisition and uh, contracting when it comes to getting the technology that they need for what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, General Nally said he's frustrated because he doesn't need stuff tomorrow, he needs stuff today, especially when it comes to cyber. When it comes to better buying power and some of the things that you've learned since you issued the first report, what kinds of things are you talking about that might help General Nally and General Corden when it comes to uh, being able to, to get stuff when the technology change pace is so, is so rapid and uh, uh, their needs are so urgent? Um, in the, there are two or three things in there, right? There are some things that we can buy very quickly. Um, uh, if it's COTS IT equipment, for example, you can do that very quickly. There are other things, and in the cyber world, it's particularly true. The cyber world, you have to be very agile, uh, uh, particularly both for cyber defense and offense. So if you're doing things there, um, you need a situation where you can immediately apply resources. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to put out contract vehicles that help you do that. Uh, generally speaking, the amounts of money are way below the thresholds that I would normally look at. So the individual projects are very small, uh, but they need to be in implemented immediately when you, when you need something done. I think we have systems in place by and large to do that. I'll have to talk to those people and see what specific problems they're having. One thing where I think we do have difficulties is the contracting process. The contracting process can take a long time. The, the other place where we can have uh, problems is, is getting money. You know, there's a couple of year lead time in the budget process to get money that's going to be dedicated for something you have to identify in the budget. Uh, but in the cyber world in particular, we can do a lot of things, you know, that, 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 that deal with those two problems. Uh, O&M money, for example, which is what we use a lot in the cyber world, and it's appropriate kind of money to use for this, for really quick fixes, you know, on-the-scene quick fixes. Uh, and acquiring, you know, equipment that's COTS, that's IT equipment that you can buy more or less through a GSA catalog. 
uh, should be something you could do fairly quickly also. I'm going to have to find out exactly what's, what's getting in the way there, but I'll take a look at that. <coughs> yeah, right here. Mitzi, you have a name tag. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School, but I've been on the with or on the fringes of DOD for 37 years, so I've watched all these changes. What I'm struck by is the complexity. We don't train people to think in complex terms, and I guess I've longed for 37 years for maps. What's the flow? How does this go? Which my perception is might be tools to help you educate this constant rotation of people on Capitol Hill hmm. if you were to do that. The other thing I do want to raise is on the social science contracts that you have, but maybe they don't belong to you. Um, my perception as a citizen is the reason we do the social science ones because we want to get data today that we can put out into the field. Uh, I was at a Minerva contract re review or whatever a couple of years ago, and I asked for the charts, and they said, oh, no, you can't get these until they're published. Well, whatever solutions they were <laughs> suggesting, we would have moved way beyond that. And as a citizen, I find that troubling. Yeah, we're trying to learn from our experiences as we go. I, every, I, I, a lot of programs come through in the pipeline, <clears throat> and they've had their experiences one type or another. Some of them are great case studies, and we're trying to publish those out of DAU so people can learn from them. I think people learn from stories probably more effectively than any other way. So when you look at what happened on, you know, you take the F-35 or the A-12 or, you know, any of our programs, you know, understanding how somebody got in trouble and what they then had to do about it to get out of it is, is a very important learning experience for people. So the stories really do matter. And getting case studies out that are current, I think, helps too, because then people can relate to that much more better. Uh, we're, one of the reasons I'm publishing this data is to force people to start to look at the data. And so as every year we're going to upgrade it and we start to track our trends. The, a, a lot of the things that happen in acquisition have a long lag, lead, lag time. So if I put in a policy um, today, and people start to implement it through their contracting practices, say, for the next three or four years, it'll be several years before there'll be any data available to tell us what the impact of that was. Uh, anything statistically significant, certainly. And one of the reasons I started this was that, you know, I've worked for a lot of different undersecretaries for acquisition. I've been, you know, a deputy and now the undersecretary. Uh, we all come in with our own ideas about what will work, and we all leave before anybody can find out whether we were successful or not. And then the new guy comes in with his, his new ideas, right? Uh, I've actually put the names, <laughs> it's true, I'm not telling everybody you're laughing. The, uh, I've, I've got a chart in there that shows performance of programs, and it's time scale, uh, overruns and, uh, and, and cost. And I've got the names of the different acquisition executives that were there when the decision was made to take that program into development. You know, and, I, and I believe in accountability. I mean, I, I put in all of my ADMs who the program manager is. I had occasion recently to go back and... Uh, look at a program that got in trouble and say, I'd like to see who was in charge when they came here and said this was all okay. You know, uh, so we can, you know, let the leadership and the service know that, uh, you know, this wasn't just a random event. You know, there were people who came and said, this program is executable. I've got enough money. It's going to work. I'd like to know who that was because if it gets in big trouble, I'd like to be able to talk to that person. Way in the back. <clears throat> this will be the last one. No, I can't do that. Michael Schrag, I was struck with your earlier list of the importance of people and management and courage and leadership in delivering the programs. I would like you to comment on the nature of oversight and governance of programs. And in your view, to what extent has oversight degenerated into compliance management versus really playing a role in accelerating and improving the quality of programs? That's a great question. Um, when I, when I got back in the building almost four years ago and I started looking at the kinds of decision memoranda we're putting out, I was struck by the long list of action items, most of which were uh, come back and brief the OSD staff, some element of the OSD staff, on X, you know, in 90 days or whatever, or do a report and give it to staff element such and such. And I started just excising those out of all our ADMs. I said, we're here to make a decision to commit billions of dollars to a project. What I want to know from you is, is it ready to go or not? I'm talking about my staff. Uh, I, I don't want, you know, you to go try to manage the program after this decision is made. I want you to tell me if the program manager is ready to go do it and if it's a sound plan. 
and then I want you to get out of the way. Um, it's, t it's been three and a half years now. Um, I, made a, I made progress with that. I still have work to do probably. As we were putting 5002 together, uh, it's basically structured with a large section that's kind of the overall system, and then there are a bunch of enclosures, uh, different areas of like program management, system engineering, developmental tests, and so on. And, and I not entirely jokingly referred to some of those uh, areas as sort of the OSD staff empowerment part of the document. And I had to go through as I'm editing uh, and say, no, <laughs> the purpose of this is not that somebody has to come give you data or tell you something so you can do oversight. The purpose of this is to help the pro program manager and the people in the chain of command do a better job. So we're pushing back on that. There is a, I, I, I view my role as the acquisition executive when it comes to individual programs is largely making the, the major commitments for that program and assuring myself that I've got a sound plan and adequate progress to justify those decisions. And then I want an empowered chain of command to go out and execute. And elements of my staff uh, are responsible for enhancing certain disciplines, if you will, like system engineering and developmental tests. Uh, and they have, a, they have a role to play there, but they're not managing the program, okay? Uh, my, my, they're called OIPT leads, the offices that have the various baskets of program types like strategic and tactical or C3I and so on. Uh, they help me with that decision-making process and they organize that and they orchestrate it and they give, me very, they give me great advice. I rely very heavily on all these people. But once the program has you know, got permission to go ahead, it's supposed to go ahead under the chain of command that's, that's in charge. Uh, I don't like the term oversight very much. <clears throat> um, I'm, a, I'm a manager, and I like having a clear chain of command. I like having people in charge of things. Oversight's a very vague term to me. Uh, either you're in charge or you're not. If you're not in charge, you can help or you can get out of the way. Uh, and that's, that's a little bit blunt, but that's the way I feel about it. Okay. Mr. Kendall, one of the ways we get you to come back is we get you out of here when you're yeah, supposed to leave. Yeah, I've got to go see leave. the secretary. And so uh, I, that we could go on for another hour in terms of questions, but uh, but I do know you have to leave, and I would like uh, you to come back and, and uh, tell us uh, an I, update I enjoy later it, on. So. And uh, it, it, it's, this is my favorite topic to talk about, Charlie. Um, and uh, David, it's always great to be with you. It's great to be with John. And uh, now that you've got this wonderful venue, I'll have to come back for more yeah, often. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Please join me in a round of applause. Thank you. We're going to move uh, uh, directly to, uh, to our panel now, and so I'll ask the panel members uh, to come up and join me. Uh, while they're coming up, you, you can sort of take a break in place. I do want to recognize the uh, support and, uh, and help that we had in pulling this together from the Aerospace Industries Association, uh, and I want to extend my gratitude and CSIS's gratitude for pulling this event together uh, with their assistance and support, and, uh, and ask my panel members now to join me up on the stage, Pierre Chow, John Etherton, and Arnold Panaro. So, welcome. So we all heard the same things that you all heard over the last 45 minutes. Um, but obviously, this is a much longer trail than a 45-minute speech and question and answer session. So at the beginning, we decided to pull together a panel of folks who have been watching these issues for a few days and, uh, and ask them to join us here and provide some insight, some commentary, and perhaps some additional perspectives, if you will. Uh, to my immediate left, John Etherton. Uh, John, as most of you know, uh, spent a few years on the Senate Armed Services Committee creating these problems, and then has, uh, for the, the subsequent 20 years or so, um, been trying to figure out how to deal with them and to fix them. And of course, he's, uh, he's been uh, a stalwart in the acquisition and the interaction of the executive and legislative branches on acquisition for a long and distinguished career. Uh, I've asked him to provide some insight into uh, specifics about what Mr. Kendall said this morning and also what he didn't say. 
Uh, to John's left is Pierre Chow. Pierre, of course, was the founder of our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, long time uh, engaged in, uh, in the uh, defense industry and defense financing of defense industry, um, and now runs uh, his own firm, Renaissance Strategic Advisors, but he remains a, a, a senior associate here at CSIS as well. And I think just a few days ago testified uh, on, before the uh, House Armed Service Committee on how to solve all these problems. Um, and then finally, at the, uh, at the other end of the, podium, of the table here, uh, Arnold Panaro. Arnold uh, also spent a few years creating the trouble as uh, staff director of the Senate Armed Service Committee, um, now runs uh, Panaro Group and, uh, and has a, a number of comments to make as well uh, at the end here. So we're going to go in order, um, and then we'll open up for questions first. I'll give each of these gentlemen an opportunity to ask another person on the table a question, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. When we get to that, we'll run the same process. You'll um, uh, raise your hand, we'll identify you, wait for a microphone, and, uh, and we'll follow that process there. John, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks, David. I guess this is working. Um, first of all, I want to say a couple things just about you know, my sort of general approach in, in my environment uh, so that you have a sense of where some of my comments are coming from. I, mean, I live in the political world of decision making, a lot of which is on Capitol Hill. Um, I think that one of the facts of life is that Congress is involved in this issue. Uh, they've been very heavily involved in the last six or seven years, and given the discussions that we're having about a the ACA implementation, I think next year's likely we're going to be involved uh, even further uh, in this, and also the interest of the two committees uh, of the Armed Services Committees in the issue will ensure that there will continue to be legislation. And I also believe that we are going to, we have to expect that legislation is the main product of Congress. And so when they see a problem, rather than wanting to hold a hearing and look at it, they're actually going to want to legislate on it at some point. Uh, we'll see to what extent that that uh, occurs uh, in the next couple of weeks as the Senate takes up the defense authorization bill on the floor. Um, I want to second uh, comments that Ed Pyatt made. I mean, I think that this uh, report is the, one of the best things, from my perspective, that's come out of the Department of Defense on acquisition policy in decades. Uh, I think it, while it is a first step, it, it looks at more correlation instead of looking at the underlying causative issues uh, in, in some of the things that, that it looked in the for different factors that it looked at. Um, I think it's a very important first step and a very um, good process that we need, to hopefully, to institutionalize in the department as we look at various policy choices that we'll be facing in the future. Um, I, I'm hopeful. I've talked to the people on the Hill about this and, you know, said, drop whatever you're doing, grab it and read it, because uh, it's been my experience up there that um, a lot of the, leg the legislation that gets developed is done on the basis of anecdotes, uh, maybe a, an oversight report or one other sort of isolated thing, and then it tends to drive a lot of decision-making and behavior for many years. So if we could get onto a process that is fed more by reports like this and the approaches like this, uh, then I think we're going to be in a much sounder basis as we go forward, especially in this very difficult environment that we're in, um, in, in looking at these issues. I think that the discussions within the report um, of the various factors and you know what seems to be the case when we have cost overruns or schedule changes or whatever and what doesn't seem to be the case or doesn't seem to be in any way related, um, again, is, 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 is important. I think it's, it's interesting to note in my reading of this that some of the, at least the instincts that inform the Weapons Systems Acquisition Reform Act, like improving the uh, cost estimating system and the process there, or looking at technology readiness and, and decisions to go into production, um, a lot of those issues, at least the importance of those issues, seem to be borne out by the information, at least preliminary information coming out in this report. So I think, you know, I've said to people up there, I think that, you know, they can take a little bit of credit for at least being on the right track. <clears throat> and I think that the most recent uh, GAO report looking at uh, trends in major weapons programs, the one that they issue every spring, although I think the points in there are very subtly made, frankly, you really have to dig through it to get a sense of what they're saying. Uh, basically bears out the fact that we are starting to see some glimmers of hope on some of the issues that people have been concerned about with respect to major systems acquisition. So I think there's, uh, there's some, some hope there. Um, it's also interesting to see that at least 
again, from the preliminary information that we have in the report, that contract type, whether we do a fixed price contract or a cost type contract, especially in LRIP, doesn't really seem to matter one way or the other in terms of outcomes, uh, at least from the information that we see. Uh, and, and then again, Congress has been very preoccupied with this, both in the development side and on the side of uh, uh, low rate initial production, and it doesn't seem to matter. So that's another point, I think, from this report and, and that I've also made to the people, including some of them who sponsored some of the le recent legislation. Um, so I think it, it, these kinds of, this kind of approach, I think, really gives a touchstone to more rational acquisition policy ma um, making uh, in that process recognizing that we are going to have various players engaged in it and Congress is going to continue to legislate on this. Um, I also think that going forward that it's going to be critical that this process be institutionalized and not be simply the product of one individual or a small group of individuals who feel very strongly and are driving the process to produce these products. They're very labor intensive um, and they, are, they do involve resources that also have other things that they need to do. Um, and so I think that's an issue uh, that really we need to, I'm a little bit concerned about as we go forward. Um, the other issue that I think also plays into this is the degree to which the current degree of dysfunction that we have in the budget process as we go forward will essentially swamp any efforts to really understand what the underlying management uh, behaviors are and what that, the inc outcomes are because if we get into a situation of such great uncertainty and such great chaos and in such unpredictability, I think it's going to be very difficult to support future acquisition policy decision making with any kind of reports like this. I also think we need to be looking at a situation where there are sort of correlation of forces or, or maybe new systems that, that will be in place which will enable sort of much more uh, sort of real time use of these kinds of techniques. And I'm thinking about the um, issues right now in the, in the area of auditability. Uh, and, the, and the systems that are being put in place now to, uh, to achieve a full auditability, some degree of auditability by uh, FY17. I think that there's some real opportunities to try to plug in some of these techniques and processes into that system and to get a more real-time understanding of what's going on in the system and, and how we spend money. I also think, though, that there's some limitations with this that we need to recognize. One is that this is mainly focused around major systems acquisition, which is in admittedly a very large uh, area for DOD and the use of resources, but there are other areas like services acquisition uh, that I don't think, I don't know how well this will work, uh, that these kind of techniques will work, and I think there are some issues there that we need to try to deal with on a more rational basis. Um, I think the other limitation that we have is that this is primarily driven based on past information and past data that we have, and I think we're on the verge of making uh, ch uh, policy choices in such areas as how do we properly define commercial items? I think that's going to be a huge issue as we go forward over the next couple of years. Uh, the, ro the rights, roles, and responsibilities with respect to intellectual property is another area that I think is an evolving policy. Um, I'm not sure that how much we can look at this kind of approach to predict what the policy outcomes will be for significant changes in those areas, and I think we're going to need to, to um, look at those limitations. But I think that, uh, again, in general, I think if we could move the broader decision-making process on acquisition policy to a system that relies on this kinds of, these kinds of information, these kinds of studies, as they unfold, I, I just think that we'll all be better off wherever the chips may fall as a result of a look at the data. Thank you. John, thank you. You've given us quite a, a long list of, of items there to, uh, to pursue as we continue the discussion this morning. Uh, Pierre, why don't you give us your perspective? So, um, Dave, thanks. Um, so if, if John comes at this for, as a deep student of the policy as well as uh, uh, from a political aspect, I come at it from, uh, again, a student of the policy, but, it, but also from a business perspective and, uh, and also someone who, uh, uh, who tries to help people with strategy as well as committing capital in, in, in this market. So we come at it very much from a, uh, a forcibly, you know, cold-hearted approach. Um, I think, and I also come at it from somebody who firmly believes that these things come in cycles, uh, and you have to distinguish between what are cyclical trends versus which ones are longer term secular trends and which ones are, are disruptive, right? So the, the issue of acquisition reform and where we're in the acquisition system, you know, is, is a cyclical phenomenon. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make is assume that the policies that are going to work for the next 10 years are the same that worked for the last 10. 
Um, we've been in an up ramp for the last 10 years. Um, we are in a downturn. That is undeniable. Anyone just needs to take a look at the numbers, even though some people sit there and claim that we're not in one. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the market peaked in 2009, and actually since the building is working on the 2015 budget, frankly, we're actually six years into the downturn. It may not feel like it if you're in parts of the industry. On the other hand, talk to the companies that are doing logistics or light armored vehicles or, many, or, or armor, et cetera, and they'll tell you full, flat out um, that they are feeling the, the effects of the downturn. Um, and so this creates, as usual, I think a window of opportunity to sort of relook and reassess where we are. So what's important, I would argue, uh, and this is a theme that I've, I've begun to see in, in a lot of these types of forums, which is, boy, we've spent dozens and dozens of years, actually, you know, spending time and, and commissions and studies and reports trying to figure out how to fix the system. Um, there's a lot of familiar faces in this room, you know, collectively. I, I shudder to think how many commissions and studies we've all collectively worked on. So the theme has become, let's not invent more things to figure out what to do, let's just figure out how to do them, right? And that's actually not a bad place to be. Um, and this, this recent effort that the uh, Mac Thornberry and, and others up on the Hill are trying to restart it, uh, another look at, at again, at, at, at the acquisition system, um, I believe they're actually approaching it in a very thoughtful fashion, which is essentially saying, can we just mine what's being out there and let's figure out what to do? And they're in no rush to do a legislative package just for the sake of doing one. They actually want to try to approach this thoughtfully, which is interesting. So if it, if, I think with that theme in place, um, that's interesting. I think we should all resist the urge to sign up for yet another commission to take a look and you know redo the analysis. I, I think we pretty much know. Um, I think the other thing where we've made, another place where we've made huge strides, and David and, and CSIS you know, worked on this with, with Beyond Gold or Nichols and, and the other projects, this notion of let's stop trying to tweak the acquisition system with the small a, which is trying to fix you know, a, a broken screw with a, long, uh, with a 20 foot screwdriver, and instead let's take a look at, at the big A, which is the interface between the acquisition systems, the requirement system, and the budget, the budgetary system. Um, I think that has been a massive leap in the conceptualization of the problem that's occurred over the last seven years or so, I think, when people started talking about it this way. Uh, because I would attribute one of the reasons why you can never end up getting different results, and despite the fact that we have layered more and more rules, more and more oversight, we've moved boxes around, we've moved people around, we've created czars, we've shot czars, we've, you know, we've done all of this stuff, and yet the, the results end up being exactly the same. It's because ultimately, if you're not looking at the inputs into the system, you know, a badly architected house, no matter how good your builder is, is still going to be a lousy house, right? And so this notion that we have to look, take a look at the overall system, um, I think is, is, a, is a notion we need to preserve um, as we go through this debate and not let go of, right? Um, if we placed as many hours and as much mental energy into looking at how we do the requirement system, as we have done on the acquisition system, I think we'd actually kind of, and put some discipline in it, um, I think we'd get, we'd get relatively far. And ultimately this you know, gets, I think, a central point that we've been trying to pound at, uh, which is many, many, and many of these studies, commissions, results, things that people talk about, in the end are trying to fix the symptoms and not the root causes. Right. I'm also encouraged with, with one other word that's beginning to show up, which we never heard in 20 years the word incentives, right? There's lots of these commissions and studies and reports that sit there and says, well, this is what should be done. And no one has said, well, what exactly is the incentive in order to cause the people to adopt this, right? And, and, and the root cause issue, I think, is tied to the incentives issue. Part of what's embedded in the root cause. One of the things that's in the root cause is we are actually asking industry and the department and its organic capability sets in some cases to push the limits of technology because we have decided almost 70, 80 years ago that technological superiority was gonna be one of the asymmetric advantages of the United States. If you're gonna push the technology limits, it's going to cost you a lot of money, period, full stop. And you will have overruns because you cannot by definition guess exactly how much it's gonna cost me to invent unobtainium which occasionally we do, 
right? And so you will never, ever, ever get the, the overrun numbers down to zero. Now that's back again to the requirement debate of where should we push, we be pushing for those technological limits and where should we accept the 80% solution? Um, and that's not everywhere. And so the incentive system tied to, you know, where do we push for technology versus not, I think is, is, is a topic that we rarely talk about. The time frames that everybody operates under are disconnected amongst all the actors, right? I have a 10-year program I'm trying to get executed with 18-month to two-year program managers overseen by two-year congressional cycle, two and six-year congressional cycles, and 18-month to three-year you know, USDA TNL you know, uh, under, executed by industry that has to report on a quarterly basis, right? All those time mismatches creates such intense friction in the system, and will continue to do so because those cycles exist for different reasons and other reasons. So the only issue that we can do, I would argue, is try to mitigate some of those differentials. Can we budget by milestone? Can we put program managers in by milestone? Having people in like Ken Creek, Frank Kendall, and others who actually are, are would like to and are willing to stay in the job long enough to overcome the, well, I can just ignore that guy because he's going to be gone in 12 months. You know, oh, no, he's actually going to be here for a little bit longer than that. Maybe I ought to listen to them. You know, that phenomenon are all parts of, I think, getting at that. And then the economic incentives, I think, are the ones that if you really want to spend some time um, you know, would probably bring the greatest fruit. And this is where we need industry to do uh, uh, as much of an education to the government side as well as the government side doing an education to the industry side, right? The lack of cross-fertilization of people and that, that spread that has occurred over the last decade or so um, does mean we have fewer and fewer people that sort of understand each other and it, it's kind of, it's, it's gotten hard to have that, um, that dialogue. But this is a system, you know, that, that it, it's the weirdest one in the world where we would much rather spend a billion dollars and give 5% margins than spend $600 million and give 20% margins, which if anybody can do the math in their heads right away knows it's actually better for the taxpayer to pay $600 million and 20% margins, right? And so as long as those economic incentives are on their heads, I think you're still going to keep getting the types of numbers that, that you get out there. Those incentives also drop into the programmatic side, right? you actually reward bad performance. If you're a program manager who's blown their budget, what usually happens, you get budget given to you. If you're a program manager that actually performs and delivers under budget and under time, what happens to you? Your money gets taken away from you, right? So I, I think time being spent on those topics, and I know Frank is astutely aware of, of, of some of those, um, with the central notion that what I'm trying to do is not eliminate them to zero, um, uh, but but mitigate and and reduce, I think will will go a long way. Um, I'm a firm believer in never let a crisis go to waste. We're going through a crisis. Um, uh, 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 it certainly feels like one, um, and and that gives an opportunity, I think, to to do that. And I'm frankly, uh, look, I'm the hopeless optimist on these topics of acquisition reform. I'm willing to bang my head against the brick wall. But you're, you're beginning to hear, I would argue, the right kinds of terms, you know, in the system. One size doesn't fit all. Let's not do yet another study. Let's figure out how to implement it. You know, I used, I heard three congressmen use the word incentives in a hearing, right? Um, I, I've heard uh, uh, people talk about big A. We should, I would argue, that those are really, really fruitful places for us to be mining if we actually really want to get from here to there. Thanks. Thank you, Pierre, and uh, that was a good survey of kind of where we are and, and what some of our opportunities are to focus going forward. We ha there have been a lot of efforts over the years to figure out what to do, and sometimes you find yourself wondering if these are such good ideas, why are they so hard? Well, they're hard in part for a whole bunch of other reasons, but uh, it, it turns out that, in fact, things are even bleaker than we thought. And uh, in order to shine a spotlight on that, I want to turn to our last panelist, uh, uh, General Arnold Panaro, um, welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, so my, my focus is going to be on the warfighting side of the military. Uh, as a you know, former infantry platoon commander with a start in Vietnam and ended my career up as a division commander, 
My greatest worry right now is the warfighting capability of the military. And as an infantry officer, I have to use pictures because I have a hard time being as eloquent as John and Pierre in words. Before, before I get started, I want to give a shout out to Brett Lambert, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Industrial Base and Manufacturing Policy, because what we're talking about here today and what I'm going to emphasize is the technology that our military needs. Brett did seminal work in trying to find out what's happening in our industry, particularly at the second and third tier suppliers. And you're going to hear my case today that without cutting edge technology, I don't care what battlefield you're on, you're not going to prevail. And, and uh, he's, he's back out in the private sector now. Brett, thanks for the terrific work you did over in the Pentagon uh, in that area. Um, and second, some of the, yeah, thanks, yeah, great. And some of the concepts I'm going to talk about this morning, uh, I, I owe to discussions with my colleagues over a number of years. Michael Bayer and I have a presentation that we call kind of the ticking time bombs in the defense budget or, or other things. Uh, we've, we've worried about these things for years. Kim Wincup, Christian Marone, my colleague over at AIA. Um, and so some, because I'm going to focus on the long term. Everybody's got a big high pucker factor about the sequester, and they should. But in the final analysis, when it comes to having real warfighting capability, uh, it's what happens in the far battle, not the close-in battle. As a military commander, you're always preparing for three phases. The close-in battle, that's the enemy's in the wire, and you better be able to deal with that. The near battle, where the enemy's going to come the next two, three months. But you really are always worried about the far battle. And in defense, for example, in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the, the great units that we had and in individuals and the equipment, every bit of that was put in place in the Carter administration and the early years of the Reagan administration. Not one weapon system on that battlefield was in the later years of the Reagan administration, not one in the Bush administration. So the decisions we make today are really the ones that are going to determine if we have any real warfighting capability 10 years from now, and that's what I'm concerned about. To, to have the world's finest military, we have it today. To have it 10 years from now, there are three essential ingredients. One is quality personnel. Two is the consistent and meaningful training that we give those personnel at the unit level. Every individual has got a unit skill, whether you're a rifleman or a machine gunner or a cyber warrior or a pilot, helicopter pilot, you have to be trained in your individual skill. And then whatever unit you're in, you have to be trained in your unit. Every unit has a set of things called mission essential task list medals and they're geared towards what that unit's role is on the combat battlefield and those units. So right now, that training is not occurring across the board. And finally, you have to have cutting edge technology. And the cutting edge technology, as Frank Kendall and Pierre and John have said, in the R&D, it takes investment, it takes industry putting their capital in an area where they think they're gonna get a return. It's a lot of, of testing, it's a lot of trial by error, um, and, and a lot of our systems have trouble beginnings but become magnificent over time. But you've got to have that going on at all times. The sequester right now is shredding two of those three legs that make up the world's finest military. Training, and the chiefs are testifying this morning before the SASC. They're going to talk about that readiness and the technology. Um, when you look at what the 13th sequester, even the prior year obligations, Tony Capasio had a question for Frank about, well, the prior year cuts maybe didn't hurt, you know. Well, actually, they, they did. They were all in procurement and R&D. The $6 billion they took in prior years was money that was supposed to be spent on procurement and R&D. Then they added another $10 billion in 13, you know, and then and I'll show you some charts in a minute on that. So the modernization is, is being put at risk. And again, you can have the world's finest people, and even if you get meaningful training and you don't have the technology, they're not going to prevail on the battlefield of the future. And I don't know how you advance the slides, but uh, I think you click on that mouse. Where do you click it, Dave? This, see, this is, this, is, this is why the Marine Corps, all we have ever wanted Ed Pyatt to deliver for the Marine Corps was a tungsten stiff bayonet that never needed sharpening. <laughs> all right, so left, let me see. Let me push side. that button. That didn't work. Let me push that button. There you go. Okay. If there's three buttons, you can count on the Marines Put the to word push out them in the to wrong all order. <laughs> <laughs> Put the word out of all future speakers. I, actually, that was the left button. I don't like pushing things on the left. I'm kind of <laughs> on the right. You, you need to kind of understand the back office. And again, this is stuff that, that Michael Baird, and Kim Wincup, Christian and I, we worry about all the time. If you want to look at the raw numbers, the downturn that we're having right now is actually less than what we had in post-Vietnam, post-Cold War in, in, in numbers. 
but it's dramatically different in its effect for two reasons. One, we don't have the cutting room we had in the, after the Cold War. We took a million active duty people out of the force at the end of the Cold War and killed off just about every major weapon system. That's not there today. You're not going to take the current 1.4 million active duty force down by a million people. Number two, and the most important thing, the internal cost drivers are fundamentally different and changed. So between personnel, health care, deferred compensation, for example, military retirement for 2.4 million personnel is $100 billion a year, and, and the cost growth and acquisition, that's taking an ever-increasing percentage of the internal budget. Defense-wide spending has gone from 5 percent to 20 percent of the budget in just the last 10 years. And the ratio, the, what we call the tooth-to-tail ratio, it's never been great, but it's actually getting worse. So we've got more overhead and less combat. And the, and the last thing is, and we've talked about this a lot, the external political balance of power is not as favorable to defense, even though the world is more unstable and even though the threats are worse. I would tell you right now, and John and Pierre, John's a true expert on Capitol Hill, the, the, the spending cut hawks and the deficit hawks have a lot more votes than the defense hawks. So you're not going to win this on the, on the political landscape that we used to be able to. So if we don't make some fundamental changes in the way we're approaching um, think decisions today to be ready 10 years from now, we're going to have a dramatically smaller fighting force. That force will be dramatically smaller, less ready, and less capable all at the same time, about 50 percent smaller. It certainly won't be a force that can provide for our national security. We just finished a study um, over, ah, let's see, back up one. Anyway, we just finished a study at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, this isn't the slide I wanted, but I don't know how to go back. Um, press the right. I did. I pushed that. I'll turn it over to somebody smarter than I. If you can make, there you go. <laughs> yeah. MIT, I can't believe it. They don't even have a football team for crying out loud. <laughs> I went to the University of Georgia. My old boss, Senator Nunn, used to say, Arnold went to the University of Georgia. That's in Athens, Georgia. It's a dangerous place. You drive through there with your window down, they'll throw a diploma in your car. <laughs> I think I was sober when they threw my diploma in the car. I'm not sure. So CSIS, all the think tanks have come to the same conclusion. We did a study because there are people out there saying the sequester is not having an impact. Baloney. It's, it's gone from stupid to dangerous. Four elements, and again, all the think tanks, whether it's McKinsey over at AEI, Todd at CBSA, Dave Berto, Clark Murdoch, there's a tremendous consensus. Force readiness is deteriorating. I mean, I went through the bad days of the hollow force. I worked in the Senate in the Carter administration and when we had the late 70s, early 80s. Right now, our C-1 source readiness rating is just as bad as it was in those days. The chiefs are speaking about it. Uh, but not a lot of people are listening, and, and I know from firsthand experience as an infantry platoon commander in Vietnam, um, the adverse effects when you have individuals that aren't properly trained and you don't have the equipment or ammunition that you need, uh, bad things happen. And that's where we are right now in force readiness. Modernization is being really, really uh, cut. Uh, you know, the bulk of the cuts in 13 and 14 are going to be in that area, and all that's going to do is, is make all these adverse trends worse because it's going to run up the unit costs, it's going to stretch these programs out, it's going to uh, de-incentivize industry from investing in R&D where they don't see any return on that investment. Frank Kendall talked about the decision process is hopelessly broken right now. Actually, when you, the Department of Defense has probably the best, most thoughtful process for figuring out how to prioritize in the PPBE. Congress used to have a thoughtful review process in authorization and appropriation bills. Um, that's been broken for sure by the sequester. And then the structural problems that I just illuminated about the increasing cost uh, of personnel and other things, uh, basically the sequester doesn't really deal with any of that. So bottom line is if we stay on the course we're on now, um, and again, this Clark Murdoch in, in, in CSIS um, has done some uh, studies on this, everybody. And if you talk to the people in the building, uh, as many of us have, while they can't say it publicly, they come to this same conclusion. Uh, the, force, the force structure, the fighting force of our military, and that's why we have a Department of Defense, for goodness sakes, uh, um, not to, so, so we all should be concerned about that. And I don't care whether you demerged in division equivalents or brigade equivalents, uh, fighter attack airplane, naval combatants, um, um, 
you know, everything is, and, and by the way, this has been going down and the sequester is only uh, accelerating uh, that reduction. And this again, um, kudos to CSIS, Clark Murdoch and company, Kim Wincup looked at this. We looked at it in some of our analytical work and there's, there's general agreement that as the top line squeezes down and the runaway cost, particularly in the personnel area, uh, when you get to 2021 at the end of the sequester, there's no money left for anything other than personnel and health care and, and deferred compensation. And you look at, if you want to measure the cost of people in O&M or you want to measure the fully burdened cost of personnel, which DOD doesn't do, they don't track the fully burdened cost. Um, the average cost today of a soldier is $384,000 a year. And that's why when they say we want to increase, you know, 10,000 troops in Afghanistan, it has billion dollar price tags. And so, uh, these things keep climbing and the force structure keeps decreasing. Uh, this one just shows you what I talked to you before about um, in graphic terms. Uh, the bathtub, we actually under the sequester, it's a hockey stick. It pretty much it goes down in 13 and 14, then flattens out and it flattens out in constant $14 at actually a higher level than the previous drawdowns. But it, the, the problem is the bang for the buck is not there. So the money that's left is going to basically a lot of overhead and a lot of non-war fighting. If you, if you talk about where we are in real numbers right now uh, and look at this, the post-sequester level at 13, Frank made the point, hey, we're spending at FY13 post-sequester levels because we know if we start spending uh, like we did in one October last year, we're going to go in the hole, we're not going to have the money. So, so if you want to compare what this 14 sequester level looks like to the current run rate, the burn rate, the 13th sequester, it's minus 20 billion, so it's 20 billion less. You want to care, compare it to the budget request, that's the $52 billion. Here's what the Pentagon wanted in the budget, it's 52 billion less, but at the current burn rate, it's about minus 20. Um, so what's gonna happen, and the big, the big thing right now is this budget conference, and I'll be candid, it's probably the last chance we have to fix the sequester, and if it doesn't get fixed coming out of that, um, we're in the death spiral for about the next three years. So what's gonna happen there, um, this is kind of my crystal ball with all the stuff in the witch's brew, double, double, toil and trouble, witch's brew and conference muddle. Um, you know, if anybody knows how that's going to come out, you know, they're a lot smarter than, than, than we are. Here, here are some possible outcomes uh, that run from, let me start at the bottom six, grand, barbin, grand or baby bargain. That means, you know, revenues, entitlements, everything gets fixed for 10 years. How many people here believe there's going to be a grand bargain coming out of the uh, thing. Okay. How about how many people believe, I don't believe there will be. I, I said hell freezes over. Of course, remember when Jimmy Carter was running for president, they said a snowball has a better chance in hell than Jimmy Carter. He got elected, so who knows. Um, eliminate the sequester. Who, how many people think they'll just get rid of the sequester? I didn't think so. All right. Now then you have the impasse remains. That's, that's you know, bet number one is they, they'll get nothing done and we'll just continue. How many people would like to bet on the in, current impasse just continuing? Yeah, so it's a good, good smattering there. No relief, meaning we stuck with the cuts, but we'll give defense a little flexibility, but there really isn't any way. How many people think that might be the likely outcome? Yeah. And then you've got the, the three and four are pretty close, short delay and partial offset, meaning you, you delay it for a year or two. Maybe you wouldn't take away the $100 billion that we've got to cut out of discretionary spending half in defense. The other one would be, you know, delay it a year or two, and we'll find $100 billion in offset. How many think one of those two? So basically, basically, you know, you got your best chance between numbers, you know, one and four. Nobody knows where it's going to come out. I can tell you that, that all of us that believe in a strong national defense and believe in our country being able to fight and win wars, we better be focused on that budget conference and getting the votes there to get some kind of relief. Uh, hopefully we'll get a, a year or two breathing room so we can get back to a sensible way of decision making. Because if nothing happens there, I fully believe we're in the absolute death spiral uh, through the remainder of this administration, you have a new president and a new Congress. And by the way, all the alarming trends that, that, that we've talked about, that, that Michael has articulated in his briefs, and Clark here at CSIS, Todd, McKenzie, Gordon Adams, everybody, the sequester makes every single one of them worse. It doesn't fix one thing. It, doesn't, it makes the tooth to tail worse. It doesn't deal with any of the runaway costs on personnel. It continues to drive down in strengths. It continues to allow the overhead to stay in place, and it makes the deal. All the good things that Ash and Frank uh, have been doing and others before them, it, it, it just is going to wipe those things off the book. You better buying power 2.0 uh, 
When it comes up against a tsunami that's a sequester, that tsunami is going to drown every bit of that out. This is just more detail on the procurement to show you these are real cuts and these cuts hurt, particularly when you've cut, you touched all 800 procurement programs. Um, and you know, you can see that in detail and look them up on CSS's website. Same thing in R&D. R&D, by the way, already was the bill payer in the FY14 to 18 budget. So if you looked at what was growing, the CAGRs in the budget as submitted by the administration, R&D was down about, um, Brett, was it about 15 to 19 percent. So it, it and, and, and other things were growing like 1 or 2 percent, FY14 to 18. So it, before the sequester, it was already the bill payer, and it's made a lot worse. And I mean, this is our seed corn. This is the bottom line. If we're going to have a, a world-class fighting force 10 years from now, if, if we basically continue on the path on R&D, we are not going to be where we need to be. And here's the reason why people said there was no impact. The $37 billion that was cut in 13, that was budget authority. But it only had a $10 billion outlay impact in the last four months of fiscal 13. And there will be 20 billion of the 13 cut that will, is hitting now in 14. There'll be another 20 billion I just mentioned to you in outlays from the 14. So that's 40 billion. So that's four times worse right in 14 than it was in 13. And you can see it's cumulative and it gets to the peak in 15. So the notion out there by some that would like to keep the sequester in place is not having any bad impacts. It's just, it's just balderdash. And then here's the way things ought to be done. You know, you've got vital interest, you've got threats, you have strategy, you develop requirements, you have the PPBE, you come to the Congress, you make your case, they approve it or disapprove it, and, and, it's, and it worked. I mean, it provided the world's finest military for a lot of years. Yeah, it's an ugly process, uh, but, but it worked and it, and it provided it. And now the sequester comes in and just breaks those links. So um, that's where we are right now, and when you break those links, um, uh, the, the area that we're focused on here today, which is modernization in the final analysis, it's the heart and soul of our military. I, again, um, you, you know, we, we have a joke in the Marine Corps, Marines can do almost anything, but they can't walk on water. So if Ed Pyatt doesn't give us amphibious ships, how do you get them to the fight? You know, the C-17, you got to have planes like that to move. You got to have helicopters. Uh, you've got to have a uh, global positioning system. Everything we do in the military today depends on precision. Where does that come from? That comes from R&D. It comes from trial and error. It comes from industry. So without a healthy industrial base, um, you know, we are just not going to make it. And we are absolutely on the wrong uh, bend side of the curve on, in all these areas right now. Thank you. Joan Pinaro, thank you. That's a, a very uh, um, uplifting and... Uh, and, and <laughs> I want to I want to suggest that perhaps you've earned another diploma here this morning, an MBA for a mouse briefing aptitude, yeah. and I, I'm <laughs> grateful to you for that opportunity. Thank you. Um, at this point, I was gonna I was gonna ha give the panel an opportunity to ask each other questions, but we've only got about 15 minutes left, and I, I know there are a lot of questions left from the floor. So I think we'll give the first opportunity for uh, questions from the floor. Raise your hand. Uh, we'll bring a microphone down, and uh, I'll start with a uh, column because he got left out and previous version. So uh, Adam, if you come on down for the uh, first question here. And uh, if you want to grab my eye and be next in line, this is a good time to do it. So. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, I think everybody here knows and would agree that things are bad and are likely to get worse. Given that uh, the deficit hawks, the budget hawks, whatever you want to call them, are in the ascendancy the Tea Party did get delivered several knocks in the uh, elections yesterday, but given the uh, small number of Americans who actually have anything to do with the military, given the small number of people on the Hill who've ever had any experience in the military, why do we think that things will get better? Well, I'll start, and then, no, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I think things will get better, but I do think, I'm always looking for hopeful elements or hopeful things in the environment. I do think that notwithstanding the fact on the Hill that you have um, a lot, you know, fewer people that have actually served in the military, I do think that's an important thing, especially for people to understand the, the military life and, and, the, and the hardships and, and some of the challenges there. 
I do think that we, I'm impressed, and I think you know, Pierre alluded to it uh, in, in terms of talking about the hearing last week with the Armed Services Committee. I think to the extent that the people have a sense of the choices that they have to make and a clear sense of that, um, I am impressed with the level of discussions that people are having in, in these places. Um, and I think that as we get more information, and I look at, obviously, my focus is on the acquisition system and the choices there, but I think to the extent that, that we have information about the impacts and things like that, we have a very well experienced, especially at the senior level uh, on the Hill, uh, on the committees that do have jurisdiction, and, and in some cases even into the leadership uh, in the House and Senate, at least a framework, a conceptual framework that would allow them to understand things as long as they can see the evidence of things happening. Um, and, and again, to the extent that people can put choices out there that are clear, um, I am hopeful that uh, once, as the evidence accumulates, that, that it will drive people in a better place on decision making. I also think it's really important to define what, you know, what better means, right? And I don't mean to be sort of parsing words, but from, from the perspective of, you know, if better we mean by, by process and how we decide, I think there's a lot of work that can be done relative to that. If, if better you mean by, you know, um, I don't want the budgets to drop, it, get over it. The, the budgets are dropping, and they do. They have since 1776. They go up and they go down. So the mere fact that they're going down is not the reason to, frankly, go berserk. And in fact, only in D.C. is a decrease of an increase a cut, okay? Those charts that show those big cycles, which are constant dollars, that's really important for policy wonks. The, the world lives in a current dollar world, right? On a current dollar basis, that chart has gone up and continues to go up, and we're talking about it going flat, right? So th there, there's, there's, there's certain elements of it. In fact, even if you take the worst predictions, and now some people are saying it could get worse than the worst predictions, but the worst predictions at the bottom still has our bottom higher than where the peak of the Reagan buildup was. If you had told somebody in 1990 that the next bottom of the next cycle was going to be, actually not higher, but, but near the top of the Reagan buildup, they would have told you you're friggin' insane for, for thinking that it would be, quote unquote, that good, right? We have an industry that is going into this downturn with a senior management team whose formative management experiences were in the last downturn. I would submit to you, they know how to handle the downturn if, you know, uh, you have an industry that has the lowest levels of debt that they've ever had, so they're going in financially healthy into a downturn, right? So the, the parts that are feeling horrible, I think, more have to do with this decision-making process and all that, and, right? If you told the Pentagon, here is your number five years from now, and you have five years to plan for it, it will do a very good job, and the, and the Congress, and the industry. The, I think the angst that we're all feeling is, 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 is in the mechanism by which we're doing it, and, and the turmoil that's creating, and, the, and the, frankly, the short-circuiting of all of these good positions that we're in, and so, you know, the, the, the better from that, you know, the, so the last point I would make, though, is, um, and, and I've said this before, right, because I've looked at the work, for example, that my firm has done. In 2008, we were doing five-year forecasts. I looked back at what were, we, what were we saying in 2008 about 2013. We're within $5 billion of where we are, including sequestration. Not because we were geniuses, but if you're willing to be cold-hearted about the analysis, I bet you this entire room collectively, we can figure out where 2018 is, plus or minus 10%. And if this room can figure out where 2018 is, plus or minus 10%, you can do strategic planning. I mean, you can plan for that. We're in a very weird world where normally the future is fuzzy and the near term is clear. So I agree, I cannot predict the next six weeks, but I submit this room can pretty much, if you're willing to get it, to be cold hearted about it and you know, we know where 2018 is, so let's get on with it. Yeah, I think that's the right approach. The, but the bigger pro it's not the number, it's what we get for what we spend. And if we don't, if we, we can have a certain number and follow the right decision process, but if they don't tackle the ticking time bombs within the defense budget, the defense-wide, the growth of personnel, health care, the ever-increasing cost uh, of weapons, uh, you're, you're not going to have the military force that you need. And I find that as you inform people and you educate people, particularly on the Hill, and you talk to them in sensible terms and, and, and say, look, we need to buy some time, 
there's a chance that they, they may, uh, you know, vote with you. And when you talk about what the troops need to prevail, you know, I'm reminded of the story in, in the Civil War. There was a Southern general, General Toombs, and a reporter asked him before the war, what's going to happen? He says, why, we'll whip them Yankees with corn stalks. Well, the, the war came out the right way. He ran for governor of Georgia, got elected. That same reporter asked General Toombs what happened. He said, them Yankees didn't fight with corn stalks. So when, when you go tell our congressmen and senators, do you want our troops fighting with corn stalks? Well, absolutely not. Well, Senator, that's what you're doing right now under the sequester. We need some breathing room to be able to put in place uh, the kind of uh, programs and systems and training and technologies so that, because we don't know what that battlefield 10 years from now is going to absolutely look like, but we know that if we don't make the investments in the next 10 years, we're not going to prevail. That, that resonates with them now. Will that win the day and the votes? Um, the other thing they understand, though, too, is force structure. A lot of these people, they may not have defense industries, and their kids may not be in the military, but trust me, when you have a, a, a 24th or the 3rd Infantry Division outside Savannah, Georgia, or you have a two armored corps at Fort Hood, or you have uh, Air Force Research Center in Dayton, they understand the job impacts, and they understand when industry lays off people, it's jobs, but when the military and the civilian workforce gets laid off, it's jobs, too. So. As bad as the Congress is on a lot of things, one good thing is they still understand it's people with jobs that vote. And so we've all got to be caught trying to educate the decision makers as to what the adverse consequences of keeping on the same course are. My apologies. Two other quick points. In 2014, we had more members of Congress coming out of the, you know, they were former veterans. And so I think that that thing is starting to swing back. Um, uh, uh, the other element of it's about speaking truth to power. Part of the thing that that's gone on, and and Ken Krieg has pointed this out in other settings. We've gone from a draft military to an all volunteer military to a professional military. There is a difference between those three categories that partly belies what some of those numbers are. And a professional military is an expensive military, even relative to a volunteer one, relative to a, and that's part of again just admitting what it is and budgeting and planning appropriately for. Like uh, Secretary Kendall, I like to do analysis on with real data. Um, the analysis I've just done is we got one question and it took eight minutes to get the answers out. We have seven minutes left. I'm going to squeeze two questions in and then see if, how we can do. So uh, if you'd bring the mic to the gentleman here who's got his hand up in front. No, no, you bring the mic to him and you bring your mic over here to uh, Jerry, to the guy in the middle. And both of you ask a question and then we'll answer them together. It's Jeff Bialos, I'm a Washington lawyer. Um, I guess uh, my question is the following. I, I'm somewhat with Pierre on this and that we have to assume there's going to be sequestration. I remember being in the Pentagon in 1999 to 2000 when Bill Lynn brought to the leadership uh, when I served there uh, the budget for 2000. And he said, look what we've done. We have a $300 billion budget. It's up from 240 and everybody got up and applauded. Okay. Today the number you're talking about is five something or other that we're going to be at with sequestration. And I guess my devil's advocate instinct is to ask why, if we don't plan the downturn right, can't we, if it's a downturn, can't we live within those means and still have a robust military? And I think there are three things to me to think about here. One is the chart we saw up on the board before that showed the number of aircraft and carriers. I question whether that's the most meaningful way to look at U.S. military power going forward. I have serious questions. I, don't, I didn't see a lot of other kinds of capability up there from UAVs to cybersecurity to a whole range of other things that defines how potent we are. Two, um, and I think I do agree with the general on this point, which is that uh, the reality is uh, you need to figure out a way to cut force structure. If you don't cut force structure in a sequestered world, um, the reality is you are going to have these problems of pushing all the costs on R&D. And three, a, a, a rule of thumb, we got through the 90s by keeping the rdt and &E budget reasonably level. Uh, while the defense procurement budget went down. And last I looked, we fought some wars pretty well uh, at the end of the 90s and thereafter. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, why isn't that a, a way forward here in a period where we're not going to probably have too many new major program starts? Thanks. All right. Jerry. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Jerry Brown. Um, anyone who comes into the department from the outside in the tail section um, looks around and says, why do we have three of these and four of those? And six of these and so on and so forth. Um, 
And again, this is probably going on back to you know, time immemorial, um, you know, back to McNamara and DLA. Um, I'd like the folks on the panel, given the squeeze on uh, you know, the growth of tail, but the squeeze on cost, to give me odds, since you're all great strategic thinkers, on the odds that two years from now we'll be back in this room talking about major consolidations of organizations and functions um, in the tail area. One hundred percent. At least on that question, right? That's that's where anybody in corporate America would tell you when you sort of face a, a downturn and a squeeze. The, what's the first thing you go after is overhead, um, and certainly uh, Gates and Panetta, um, uh, you know, started talking about it. Um, uh, so, um, I, I, if if you really want to do it, 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 it's the issue of taking a look at what the priority stack is and what's genetically core to the institutions that we're talking about, and what will they start to shed. Right. Frankly, in some ways, there is still too much money in the system for people to start looking hard at that. If we go down the curve, you know, um, uh, uh, and look at buying power, you're, you're going to have a good hard look at all of those, which is why in some ways I, I'm actually long-term structurally bullish about the opportunities for the industry on, on taking over some of those, some of those functions. Um, I think, you know, Jeff, your point about capabilities versus sheer numbers is a, is a very a student and pointed one, right, in terms of how we, how we measure that. Um, I think at some point, numbers become, quantity becomes quality, right? I, we're probably not close to that in, in lots of areas, you know, based on, on, on where you go. And the only difference where history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes, you know, with, with that element is um, I could cut a lot of procurement and keep my R&D alive the last time around because I had all that Cold War inventory to live off of, which I'm still living off of, and is now getting really, really old. And so the question becomes, do I have a reversion of that phenomenon where I, I don't have that, that inventory to live off of that forces me to do a procurement versus R&D trade-off? So I, I, I think that's going to be one of the hardest issues and one of the most fascinating ones to zoom in on is not the overall investment dollar number, but what's that mix shift between R&D and procurement? Um, and that, that's going to be a little bit partly, uh, I think, a function of kind of where we are in reality relative to some of the issues that you've raised about. I'm going to cut it off at, at that point. Uh, it is, we could actually discuss this usefully, and, and uh, in fact, half of this audience could be up on the podium here as well, or maybe all of you. Uh, and this is, this is a topic that we're not going to finish today. Um, but in deference both to our panel members and to those of you who have given up a big chunk of your morning to be here, we do want to end on time because that way we might get you to come back as well. Um, I would ask you to do two things. One, join me in, in thanking the Association, uh, Aerospace Industries Association for their support. And second, join me in thanking our panel uh, for their participation in joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll assemble a victory party after the budget conference has produced a result. Thank you.